Okay. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm very excited to welcome Dr. George Tiley. Uh, George is a Marie Curie Fellow uh, working at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q uh, the UK. Uh, before that, he was a postdoctoral researcher at Duke University working with Anne Yoder on uh, lemurs. So his research interests are quite broad from the plant world, primates, many things uh, in between. And uh, he has a long-standing interest in the natural history of Madagascar, and he will be telling us a little bit about that today, as well as um, some work on bioinformatics and computational methods for polyploid data. And uh, another interesting thing about George, and then that's the, that's the end, I'll let you keep talking yourself, um, is that he's a really committed ally on matters of inclusion and diversity and equity through his partnerships with uh, local institutions and educational programs in Madagascar. So I think that's also very interesting, in addition to the cool research that he does. Okay, thanks so much, George. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Claudia. Yes, I'm uh, George Tiley. Thank you for hosting me today. And a couple of things before we get started, just acknowledges acknowledgments up front so it's not rushed at the end. I want to highlight that a lot of the work that happens here happens in collaboration across institutions, um, both temperate and tropical, especially Madagascar. There's a lot of on the ground work that needs to happen before we really get to these stages. And then just to acknowledge um, you know, the funding that's being supported through this Mary Curie um, facilities within the UK. And of course, thank you to the RBGQ. And a couple of caveats before we get started. I think today I just wrote a talk that I wanted to give for a while. And I want to tell a story about Madagascar that I don't think is told often enough. So there will be points in time where I keep the technical details light. If you have questions, you can ask, but I'm going to forgo some of that for the sake of telling the story. And there will be points in time where I'm presenting my interpretation of results that are not necessarily shared by everyone in the community and that are not necessarily the consensus position and that are more perspective. So I'm happy to discuss these things as well if questions arise. So first, I just want to say, like, what is a brief natural history of Madagascar in case you are unfamiliar? And I think maybe you've seen a series on the BBC or Nat Geo specials or other types of media with very pretty pictures. And it shown it's this ecologically complex place, rich forest, rich biodiversity. And indeed, here is a simplified model, according to the World Wildlife Foundation, of the major ecoregions of Madagascar. Three things to focus on. You have humid rainforest in the east, you have dry forest in the west, and you have this expansive grassland in the middle. And today, it's really debated as how much grass should there be in Madagascar? Should there be any? Should it be 30% land cover? Should it be 65% land cover? But the important thing is it is a mosaic of grassland and woodland, and there are these uh, really abrupt ecological transitions if, if you were to travel around. Uh, some mechanics of what happens here in this central highland savanna, these central highland grasslands. Um, Madagascar has a wet season and a dry season. There are monsoon rains, there's a lot of precipitation, more precipitation here than most other tropical grasslands. This helps the vegetation grow. There's this period of drying and everything dries out. And then fire is a natural part of this ecosystem. Humans have become an increasing component of this fire-driven ecosystem, but presumably there were natural fires. Um, and so the question is, was it always this way? Was fire always such an important component of Madagascar? Was it always this much grass? And then what is the human effect in these ecoregions or on biodiversity? And just a, a couple of quick numbers from the plant perspective. Why, why do we care about Madagascar? The most recent counts, there's 11,500 species of vascular plants there. 
82% are endemic. And then for people who love grass, which um, they're economically important, they're important to ecosystems. Not a lot of people want to study them because they're difficult things to look at under microscopes and so on. There's about 550 species, um, 220 some odd are endemic. Hmm. And so how did Madagascar get to that current configuration of ecosystems? If we roll all the way back to Gondwana, you know, 170 million years ago in that top left, it's smack in the middle of what's present day uh, African continent and India. Um, around 135 million years, the breakage from Africa was complete. It was still attached to present day India. By around 80 million years, Madagascar was completely separated from all other present day land masses and certainly isolated by the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction event around 65 million years ago. So what that means is that a lot of the lineages present in Madagascar today got there through dispersal rather than vicariance as the primary mechanism. Doesn't mean there's no vicariance, but it's primarily dispersal, especially for the macrofauna. And we'll talk about that because this has lemurs and grass in the talk. Um, so what happened after that separation from the KT boundary onward, Madagascar shifted northward um, and it moved from outside the tropics to the tropics. And that brought a couple of things. It brought more heat. And so on the bottom there is a reconstruction of the paleoclimate. We see it's quite hot there on the west coast now where we have the dry deciduous forest. And it also brought more humidity. So as we move uh, into the tropics, we can start to see where there's gonna be more precipitation on that East Coast. A couple of things this means that like not all of those biomes we saw on that first slide are the same age. Those dry forests, drier habitats are older than this Eastern humid forest, perhaps about 30 million years old. And now where do the grasses fit in to this story. Um, and well, I, I want to touch on humans real quick because they're going to become an important part too. The earliest settlements in Madagascar date to about 2,000 years before present. Um, and the earliest archaeological studies determined they were Austronesian. And this can also be done through linguistic analyses. The Malagasy languages shares more with Austronesian languages than it does African languages. Although at the time in 1993, the late Robert Dewar did surmise the Malagasy languages shows Austronesian roots with uh, long contact with Bantu speaking or African languages. It's really cool because then this, you know, from limited archeological evidence, was bolstered by human genomic studies 25 years later. Um, so now with analyses of whole human genomes, um, both from people in Madagascar and the source populations determined that there was um, the settlement of Austronesian people around that 2000 year mark, perhaps a little older. And then there was admixture with uh, African uh, Bantu speaking populations later on, in addition to some admixture from India, Pakistani peoples as um, trade became more possible towards the present. And this doesn't mean that there were no people ever present in Madagascar before 2000 years ago. And this is a very contentious point I bring up in terms of the origins of Grassland. There were likely visitors present in parts of Madagascar well before 2000 years ago. The oldest dates show um, you know, some evidence of butchery and cut marks on now extinct megafauna, such as the elephant bird, dating towards about 10,000 years ago. But these are just not associated with uh, 
you know, archaeological sites, human settlements, or the type of large scale vegetational changes we would see after introduction of Zebu cattle. So around the time, uh, or a little before this earliest archaeological evidence, you started to have some of the earlier paleoecological studies where people would take soil core samples from crater lakes and soil core, meaning you just take a hollow metal tube, jam it into the ground, could be 10 meters, could be 40. Um, depends on how patient you are for cutting a long tube of soil into sections and counting pollen grains and other bits. Uh, it's tedious work, but very important. And the earliest studies from the Central Highlands, because this work has been done in other parts of Madagascar, other ecosystems, the story can change slightly, but it's more or less the same. The pollen spectra show a clear increase in grasses around uh, 1,500 years ago onward. And that was the limitation of some of these earlier cores. But just to point out, um, you, you can classify these pollens in the families, okay, sometimes getting to species level stuff is very difficult. So we can't say who were the dominant species exactly. But there was increases in grass pollen, just as you saw a decrease in the relative abundance in woody pollen, such as aracoids, brushy things, and then an increase in fire from charcoal evidence this type of study would be bolstered uh, by independent studies at different sites, by independent researchers. But something to keep in mind as people started to look deeper in these paleonog paleontological records was that what we saw at 1500 years ago wasn't necessarily unique. It's a cyclic thing. When we look into the past, there were periods of where grasses increased Woody taxa decreased based on the pollen record and you know so, some other pieces of evidence, but certainly fire has been a part of this story for a while as well. And I'll just point out, uh, because we'll, we'll talk about some periods later on, from this one study where they look about 35 meters deep, and that's that spike in graminoid pollens towards the bottom that decrease in aracoid pollen as well. Approximately, that's about 135,000 years ago, close to the last interglacial period. To go beyond that further in time is very difficult. Like I said, it takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of work to do these types of studies. Um, but there's other tools that the paleoecologists have at their uh, disposal for reconstructing what past environments look like. We'll talk about photosynthesis a little bit later, but important thing to keep in mind, a lot of grasses like to use this thing called C4 photosynthesis, highly effective at fixing carbon. We'll talk about that. The ancestral state in plants, most people think is C3. And these uh, different photosynthetic mechanisms leave isotopic signatures <clears throat> because they create different carbon molecules. So there are, no grazers present today in Madagascar. They went extinct with megafaunal extinctions. Um, but there were these now extinct, who we think were grazers, such as two species of pygmy hippopotamus. There were giant lemurs. There were elephant birds. And so when uh, some teams look at these isotopic ratios to determine were they eating mostly C3 plants or did they have a mix of these C3 and C4 diets, assuming C4 is associated with grass. Um, certainly at the top there from the Holocene to the present, there's a good amount of C4 grass in the diet of elephant birds. If you're willing to go a little bit deeper in time between the last glacial maximum and the Holocene, we can see at least some hippopotami were eating C4 plants. And then going beyond that towards the last glacial maximum onward, um, perhaps this now extinct giant monkey lemur was also including C4 plants in its diet. Um, I, I think these types of studies are in, incredibly cool 
but then they ultimately have the limitations of you need the materials and the to look at and just the fossil record in Madagascar is not very strong. There's a lot of sub fossils, but it's just not a good environment for fossilization. And to to summarize all of that, I just want to say these types of paleoecological records have been reviewed many times by interdisciplinary groups or people from particular uh, perspectives. And I think most people agree on the idea that grasses <clears throat> were present in Madagascar before people, that this type of cyclic uh, ecosystem existed. But the debate lies how extensive were the grasslands. And just, just to summarize, here is a shot of the Ancapo Bay protected area. This is a site in the Central Highlands we'll talk about a little bit later. This is a one kilometer square patch of forest. You can find mouse lemurs in there. You can find some about four species of cool frogs, a lot of nice plants. Um, so you see how it kind of nestles into that valley. And the question is, were these forests limited to these types of valleys? Were they more widespread? Were these grasses it's always a part of the story? Um, and it's important we, we clarify now, sometimes you will hear a number tossed out there. Madagascar was 90% forest. Uh, Malagasy people showed up, destroyed it. Uh, and this is just a relic of colonial era racism. That, that's what it is. There was never continuous 90% forest. That was a claim made by colonial naturalists at the time without any real evidence. And that's been debunked by a wide variety of science, scientists from different disciplines. And it's just to point out that a lot of, when we talk about ecological degradation, forest degradation in these habitats now, it's really on the background of this colonial era where the worst deforestation really happened uh, during this period of French colonization, and you know, which was a military takeover of a sovereign nation. Um, but now to, to focus on, on grasses a little bit. Um, right. Grasses really like C4 photosynthesis, and that's probably part of why we have, you know, 10,000 of them, and especially a lot of panicoid grasses. Approximately half of them are using this photosynthesis mechanism, although there are some subcategories there. And I just want to point out that like grasses in Madagascar make sense when you take a step back and look at the global perspective too. When do grasslands arise globally? Um, a few things to keep in mind. C4 photosynthesis is probably advantageous under low CO2 conditions because it's more effective at fixing this carbon. And if we look at dated phylogenies, the earliest origins of C4 photosynthesis date towards um, about 30 million years ago, but we saw this diversification and independent gains of C4 throughout the Miocene. And that's kind of what this panel we're looking at on the left here. Um, you're also seeing that blue line is showing there is some aridification going as well. So not only do you have decreasing CO2 for the origins of C4, but you do have increasing aridification. And then if you want to thrive under really arid conditions, you want to keep that those stomata closed so you're not losing water. Um, and those types of isotope ratios we talked about earlier, if we look on the right, I know these are hard to see from a distance, but if we look at grassland ecosystems today, the isotopic signatures in the ungulates or grazers present in these areas, it seems like C4 becomes more abundant around 8 million years ago. That's kind of the, the rough time point I'll throw out there, but certainly late Miocene origins of grassy ecosystems. They're not that old. Um, and what happens when we look at dated phylogenies of grasses from Madagascar? Indeed. Uh, origins of endemic C4 clades date to about 8 million years ago. Um, 
just with the caveat that dating phylogenies and grasses is a little contentious because some people will um, take, take uh, argument with the calibration points, but these seem to be robust to however you calibrate the phylogenies. And just pointing out in terms of dispersal figures, Madagascar shares a lot of grassy taxa with uh, East Tropical Africa, Southern Africa, on those little bar plots, the numbers on the right are showing you the number of species that are shared. And then the black part of the bar chart is the C4 taxa, the gray is the C3. So there's certainly a lot of C4 grassy taxa shared uh, with these um, you know, African ecosystems where uh, ancient grasslands are well accepted. And I, I hear what you're somebody saying like, well, you have a lot of dispersal, but if it's ancient, there should be a lot of endemic species too, right? And Madagascar sits very well in these types of relationships. If you look at the total number of grass species, so at about 550, um, and given the number of endemic species you're observing, it's well above that one-to-one -one line. If you look at other land masses, the blue dots there are other islands. It looks about what we think an island with you know, just natural endemic taxa should look like. And indeed, for the area, there are a high number of endemic species. So this is all to say that we feel pretty good that the grasses have been there a while, but also that fire has been a part of this story for a while too. Um, so what we're going to look at in, in these charts here, we're looking at the mean phylogenetic diversity. There's uh, that box on the top left, we're looking at disturbance. These are forms of grazing and trampling. And this, this type of data is collected through uh, plot collection methods where there's also surveys with local people in addition to working with guides to put together the frequency of disturbance in these areas. So maybe disturbance will result in a loss of phylogenetic diversity. But certainly, if you look at sites where there's been putatively low frequency fire, medium and high, just kind of putting it in these very rough buckets, there seems to be no loss in endemicity with fire. Um, so certainly, we feel that fire is a natural part of this system. And everything I presented was just like background, not my work. So now it's time to introduce mouse lemurs where, where I, I come into the story. Um, and yeah, I, I think everybody needs like some cute pictures and they're, I'll say they're small bodied nocturnal strepsorine primates. Their speciation events in this group are very recent and we'll, we'll talk about how recent pretty quick. Um, and I got interested in connecting them to the vegetational change because their movement is assumed to be restricted to the tree canopies. That's where they make their nests. That's where they have their lives. Um, they said they're nocturnal. They communicate a lot through uh, acoustics. Uh, they appear to have some mating calls, alarm calls, and they have expanded the marinasal receptors compared to other primates. So perhaps pheromones or other chemosensation is a part of their conspecific mate recognition and their ability to find their way about um, to their nest. And for those unfamiliar with primates, I'll just orient you. Um, tree shoe is our outgroup. Strepsorion are sister to what we call haplorini primates. That includes the Southeast Asian tarsier and all monkeys and apes. And there's about 25 species of mouse lemurs. I say about because it's debatable. I would like for there to be less and maybe we're working towards that. Um, but the age of the common ancestor of Microcebus dates to about 10 million years ago from molecular clock models. Um, and yeah, I, I don't I don't want to get into the weeds of like clock models and versus other calibration methods. But if we were to calibrate these divergences with mutation rates that comes out to about 1.5 million years, 
So there is a gap there in terms of what, what is the stage. Um, but that aside, the interesting thing about mouse lemurs, you see some blue dots there smack in the middle of the central highlands. That's where Ancafo Bay is. There's a neighboring site not too far from there, the Ambo Hitantele Special Reserve. And, and this is how I, I ended up working with my, my former postdoc advisor and, and Yoder, just because I thought that there were interesting questions here that needed to be addressed. Um, and the, the question is, how do you get from Eastern rainforests into uh, the Central Highlands? Certainly, you can imagine these small body lemurs hopping from branch to branch, moving in some type of closed vegetation form like this. Here's a site at San Arrivo in the southern extent of this eastern rainforest where you can find the species. And then just to remind you, did they cross open grassy um, uh, fields to, to get to the center or were there corridors available to them? And I'll just say part of the story thickened with like Microcebus lehilatsara. We were actually, we started off looking at a smaller section of Northeastern Madagascar that's treated as like a biodiversity hotspot. It's really at risk. And we, we named a new species as we sunk another one. Um, so this cute guy in the center at the time called SP3, this is now called Microcebus uh, jonahi, named after the Malagasy primatologist, Jonah Ratzenbazafi. And uh, they're, they're, we consider Microcebus to be a cryptic species. They're really hard to differentiate. They're just kind of small mouse lemur looking things of rufous color. But if you do the morphometrics, hopefully you can sort out some species. Our candidate species seem to um, separate out nicely from this other one that occurs in Sympatry with, um, as well as its sister species. However, when we looked at this other one, Metermyri, Lehi Latsara, looked like population level variation. Um, but, you know, there's not nothing there. There's a reason people name them differently to begin with. And I just want to point out in this region of northeastern Madagascar, I really like grasses. I like grasslands. I'm, I'm pro grassland. But that's not to say that deforestation is not a problem in this area. Even if we look at satellite tree cover from the 1990s to 2018, you can see how a lot of these forest fragments are, uh, how these forests are becoming highly fragmented. And perhaps these animals are losing their ability to uh, migrate um, between them. But now to, to get back to this kind of, the one candidate species case and what we did with Lehi Latsara, um, we were interested in applying this metric that was catching on at the time. A lot of people are interested in how do we use molecular data to define species. And uh, we can derive some, some terms. One here is the genealogical diversity index. And if, if you are willing to make some assumptions about neutral evolution and coalescent theory, to say that's the probability that the sequences from a population coalesce before the speciation time the thing you're comparing it with. Certainly when we looked at the candidate species um, and, and its sister, they kind of clear these heuristic barriers, but I, I just want to stress that like these heuristic guidelines are not enough I, for saying what's a species and not, but we look at multiple lines of evidence. When we look at the PCAs, the, the new candidate species separate out from its um, sister quite well. However, if you look in that top right box B, we see Lehi Latsara and Mittermeierite smashed on top of each other in the PCA, which is just a good tool for looking at genetic variation in populations. But something that's super simple that I really like, just looking at patterns of isolation by distance. So here we're just looking at the physical, geographic, straight line distance some people will spice it up with variation in topography, river barriers, and so on. Um, and then the genetic distance. So for Microcebus macarthuri and Chanahi, we see this clear break where there's 
they're not falling out along this same regression line. There's probably other factors driving um, that observe genetic distance. However, when we look at the within species and between species variation with Metamira and Lehilatsar, they fall out along that regression. And that's kind of what we expect for populations. So uh, to, to move on there, we had good evidence that Okay, we need to synonymize this uh, Mittermeieri fellow and then deal with the story of Lehilatsara in the context of Madagascar's um, forests and the Central Highlands. Here's an idea of the sampling. We have some forest patches in the north, some forest patches that I'll call the south. They're not the most southern extent of these forests, but the southern end of their range. And then these Central Highlands a few major rivers are highlighted there. Uh, something to take out from some phylogenies of these groups, and this is all using a RADSEQ data. There's a lot of sites here. Strictly filtered, did it multiple ways. Um, the earliest splits separate these northern rainforests from the southern ones, and then there seems to be some divergence of these southern rainforest patches with the central highlands. Um, and this is largely reflected in the patterns of genetic structure as well, whether you want that to be a structure analysis or we can do more PCAs. Um, and then we can look again at these patterns of isolation by distance and a few weird things pop out of there. Um, for example, that Ambo Hitzenteli and Ankafo Bay comparison. It's going to be that tiny red dot all the way to the left. Um, it has pretty high genetic distance between these things, despite having a really close proximity to each other. And then in that top right, those dots you see all coming out above the regression line. Those are comparisons of this northern forest to the central highland sites. Um, we started to put together some demographic models to say, well, what's the story of uh, divergence time, patterns of gene flow, and population size through these groups? And we, we had a number of populations to deal with, and I just kind of made a call. We would split it up and deal with the hypothesis testing separately and then put it together to do some joint parameter inference. A lot of statisticians will cringe um, at this idea, but sometimes you just have to do things out of practical necessity because we would have had too many models to test. But we can isolate these things. So we want to say, what, well, what was going on between those previous Mittermeieri groups and these northern Microcebus Lehilatsara populations? It seems like at some point there was a degree of post-divergence gene flow that then just broke off. Um, and the timing of the splits of those populations, it's really hard to say anything satisfying about it because even the confidence interval kind of straddles the last glacial maximum in this time of human impact. We see repeated stories for whether we want to compare those northern rainforests to the south. Although when we look at those northern, at that sort of panel in the middle, B, comparing the northern rainforest to these southern pieces. There was post-divergence gene flow between some of these that cut off more recently. And again, that happens around this Holocene barrier between the last glacial maximum and human impact. And we can even look at more complex models between the southern rainforest and the central highlands. And it seems like there were, however, uh, some evidence of gene flow um, throughout. You know, we also looked at these sort of migration end models, and and this one kind of won out. Um, and now, when we when we put it all together, we come up with an unnecessarily complex model, but we just chase the AIC scores and do do the best we can to interpret it. Um, and I'll one thing I'll say when you get into these fairly complex demographic models, and this is based on site frequencies, right? You're gonna have some non-identifiable parameters, especially all these migration rate things. There's gonna be a lot of combinations 
of these parameters that can give you the same likelihood score. But a, a few things to take away from it. Some of the oldest splits in, in this model certainly predate even the last interglacial period, perhaps about 500,000 years ago. And that's like not too far off from what we came up with in the previous study involving microcephus genahi. However, a lot of the more recent splits within the north, within the south, within the highlands that happened in this period between the last glacial maximum and human impact. And there is some signature for a very recent uh, population size decrease around this time of human impact. Mm. And just to do kind of a sanity check, make sure we're not going down a rabbit hole, we do some independent analyses uh, with this model called stairway plot. We're still working on these site frequency, allele frequency type data, but we fit a essentially fit a piecewise uh, constant model of population size change and say what explains the distribution of allele frequencies. And for all populations, we find this nice little trend of some large decrease associated with paleoclimate and perhaps a secondary anthropogenic effect. And just something to keep in mind with all of these analyses, they can be a bit sensitive to sample sizes. So what you're seeing there on the left is when we standardize everything to the same sample size. As you add more individuals, I, I just think that's kind of the more realistic scenario where you see what's happening with the previous uh, Mitter Meyeri in the north, these types of continuous declines, because we're talking about um, you know, pretty, pretty complex scenarios going on. But now, how, how were the Central Highlands co connected? And we propose that, well, there were these riparian forests. If you were to look at satellite images from the 70s, you can identify where there were previous forested areas that have now been converted to rice paddies. And we we're suggesting, well, that's how the gene flow broke off. These corridors were broken, but that there were plausible routes for the mouse lemurs to get around that, again, did not necessarily involve this idea of a continuous forest um, between now the current day boundaries of the Eastern Forest and Uncafo Bay. <clears throat> And, and that's kind of where, where mouse lemurs end. And I have a background in, in plants and I just kind of wanted to say, well, what can the plants tell us directly? Can we go after grasses? Um, there, there's a lot of good reasons to not work with grasses and work with mouse lemurs. We got to deal with polyploids. We don't know what a generation is. Um, and just dealing with the genome complexity and the taxonomic uncertainty of some of these groups. And, there's maybe a few different models that we could pursue that would be informative. And just to point out that there are gonna be some species that are adapted to fire and grazing, some that are very shade dependent, but we ended up going with this uh, one species, Ludicia simplex. It's quite pretty. It will get somewhere between one meter and two meters tall. You can disappear in fields of it in Madagascar. And I, I like it a lot because it's easy to find. I think that's good for these types of studies. You want something that's easily recognizable. You can drive around, very easy to spot. And you can even see in this picture on the right, areas where it's really adjacent to recent plantation or other types of cleared fields. We, we think it's um, a good indicator of ancient grasslands or natural grasslands. And plus there were some existing resources. The hardest part of any of this work is just getting the samples, especially population level samples. There was a fairly large microsat study that was done, um, just kind of showing that there was separate clustering between Malagasy and South African individuals. Um, and the haplotype networks from those microsat suggested there was maybe low diversity at the northern extent of the range. Um, and yeah, before we, yeah, let's go back. Something to come out of the Microsat study though, uh, that I, I think you have to be a little bit crazy to do this on purpose, but there's poity variation within the species. Probably diploids 
tetrapoids and hexapoids. Um, but something I've been interested in for a while is how do we deal with polypoids in a number of contexts. And previously, we were working on bioinformatic pipelines for phasing data to be used for network analyses of species. So how do you say who are the parents of an allied polypoid species and can phasing help that? And so since then, I've, I've done some work to extend the methods to deal with some population level questions, uh, such as estimating ploidy directly from the data that I don't trust at all. And then, um, but, but to also generate these types of site frequency spectra. And while we were waiting for uh, some of the population genomic projects to get off the ground, a little toy idea was, can we exploit target enrichment data to do some population genetics in plant groups that are just lacking the genomic resources? Because we, we did not have them at the time. And we were able to generate a little bit of target enrichment data. Um, so if we take a very broad sample of these Ludicia simplex, uh, a few lessons to, to learn from this. I, I think you can get away with using this type of data for analyses of population genetic structure. We're pretty consistent with the previous microsat results. Um, but the important thing is you have to deal with heterozygosity in some way, but it doesn't really matter if you get the ploidy right. So what we're looking at here on the top right, the, that very top structure graph is when we treat the data as hexapoids correctly, the second one is where we incorrectly treat it as diploids, and the bottom one is where we ignore ploidy altogether. Um, so, yeah, I, I think as long as you deal with heterozygosity in some way, it's okay even if you don't get, get the ploidy right. And there, there's a weak signal of isolation by distance, um, and we'll, we'll get into maybe what that means a little bit later. If you do the permutation test, it's significant, but not particularly what you'd expect from just going from A to B and having this nice regression. And I was interested in can, what kind of mileage can we get out of other types of demographic models, perhaps those that use gene trees for this question. Um, and we, we come up with this result of perhaps there were increases around a million years ago. This is dotted with caveats of what you think about generation time for perennial grasses. Um, but something to point out that these types of demographic models that use gene trees, they cannot really recover these type of anthropogenic or Pleistocene effects that we're interested in. Now that depends on a little bit of the life history of the organism, but if we take something that's pretty normal, we would think for plants. On the right are some simulations. The black dotted line is the true history. The red line is the reconstructed history from the simulation. You can maybe detect a small effect, but certainly um, I, I think it would be very squishy to interpret that in a satisfying way. And this becomes harder as you deal with large population size organisms, such as grasses. This might make sense in low population organisms, but um, it, it gets difficult as the pop size increases. So we, we really needed to do the population genomics and just a few things. We did a lot of new collecting and I, I want to highlight when we do collecting, it's not just here's my target species, I'm going to get it and move on. We set up these ecological plots where we sample a one meter circle 25 times in five meter distances. And the reason we do that is because it allows us to sample the ground layer pretty well. If you look at the fair faction curves on the right, you can see we do a pretty good job of getting all the grass species in an area once you get to about 10 plots. Then if you're interested in like Fabaceae, you know, other types of forb species, things on the ground layer, <clears throat> you, you can get a lot of them and it gives you some measure of relative abundance and a lot of good ecological data. So if you're interested in uh, this type of ecological data, I suggest looking at the citation there, and all of this is getting put online, available for analysis. And I'm not the only one doing it. I've probably contributed the least amount uh, to this. There's just a picture of the field on the right. And another good thing about these type of plot methods for collecting, it allows us to really highlight 
probably some underrepresented species and natural history collections and understudied such as sedges. And then we're not just focusing on what we think are the ancient grasslands. We can do comparisons to like what is putative degraded forest. So we can go into national parks where there've been recent fires. There's a very nice uh, baobab there on the right. And essentially we can say, what are the grass communities in recently degraded areas? What are the grass communities in places we think that are ancient? And now for where we're at with Fudicia simplex, the reference genome is coming online. We found a diploid in South Africa. That's sort of the, the template for this. Um, we confirm this with the C values, so some flow cytometry, and then just looking at the chromosomes from root squashes. We counted a 2N chromosome number of 24. That makes 12 for the haploid number, if we did it right. And the base number for the group is 10. So it's got two extra chromosomes. Maybe something happened, or maybe we just has some fragile chromosomes in, in, in the mix, but we counted a good number of cells. Now, if we look at something that was previously inferred to be a hexaploid from the genetic data from the preprint we have on with target enrichment and the microsat study, uh, now we're coming up with that it's a triploid. It's very confusing. Uh, the chromosome number is 40. Maybe that's a tetraploid if the base number is 10. Maybe it's a triploid with some extra things that happened along the way. But the flow cytometry estimates will, would make us think it's a triploid. So we, we don't really have a good handle on what, what ploidy levels are in the organisms. And my, my suspicion is that maybe there's some factor of ancient whole genome duplication in the group. And we hope to figure that out pretty soon. We have about 90x uh, PacBio data underlying this and the high c data came in last week. We'll get it scaffolded pretty soon and hopefully do the comparative genomics. Um, but just a quick peek at where the population genomics stands. We're waiting on another NovaSeq lane to come in. Um, I know this will be kind of hard to see, very poor node support throughout. The only thing that we can say with confidence is that single Madagascar origin, our sampling from South Africa forms a clade, our sampling from Angola forms a clade, and Madagascar forms its own clade. And now the earliest diverging branches in here come from the central high altitude regions of Madagascar. Um, these are labeled here as uh, Ansarabe and Etremo. Um, but a really interesting thing about these, based on the C value estimates I've collected so far, we still need to do more. These seem to be the diploids. That big clade at the top there that has a lot of things from Western Madagascar and the individuals from Northern Madagascar all seem to be, you know, in this triploid C value category. So we, we have to start questioning, well, what's the mechanism of grassland expansion? Was there an ancestral distribution of diploids? And did we see maybe changing conditions where polyploidy became selectively advantageous outside of the natural range? Um, and you know, to deal with questions of what is the range of Udisha simplex, I've had a master's student from the University of Montana Marivo doing really fantastic work. Um, this started out as a taxonomic investigation because I said we were going to work with Udisha simplex, but we had very squishy ideas of what, a, what the species was at the time. Previous taxonomists had even suggested it was, there were multiple species in Madagascar and the, the Rudisha simplex in mainland Africa was separate from that one. She's done some really good morphological analyses. Um, and the conclusion is that we are dealing with one species, whether we're looking at the mainland African populations, at least those in East tropical Africa and South Africa. And the only really significant characters to come out of this, you get taller plants and bigger inflorescences in the west and the north, where we have those polyploids. It's non-significant, the, the spikelet length, but they seem to have larger, uh, smaller spikelets, if we were to just be very qualitative and hand-wavy about it. So we're still working out the kinks, but perhaps there is 
um, something about being polyploid that makes you a little bit bigger vegetatively and we're just unsure on the mode of reproduction of those at this time although we did manage to get some uh, some seed to grow in, in the glass house so perhaps that's a type of mixes we have no idea um, but just to do a quick uh, niche reconstruction to give you an idea of where Ludicia simplex is, here is uh, what happened after thinning our uh, spatial data set, the habitat suitability. And what China did was reconstruct different ecological niche models for, say, all of Africa, just South Africa, where the sampling is really good. Uh, panel C there is multiple countries, but that's what we're calling East Tropical Africa and then Madagascar. An important thing to take away, if you do the projection from the environmental niche space from, say, South Africa onto Madagascar, um, there is not a lot of overlap, but they certainly overlap in this limited range of the Central Highlands. Some of these parts of sub Southwestern Madagascar, where if you're familiar, Izal is located, it implies grasses should be on that east coast, but of course, that's where we have this humid rainforest. The same if we project East Tropical Africa onto Madagascar, the niche overlap is you know, not, not too great, but they do agree on this central Madagascar plateau. So perhaps we're learning where those boundaries are, um, but there might be some unique things to Madagascar's fire regimes that determine where the grasses lie. I know I'm running out of time, but I just want to say a few quick words. Um, there, there's a lot of really skilled and good young Malagasy scientists, and maybe this wasn't the case, um, you know, two generations ago. Although I think they're incredibly talented people, who have, uh, like, if you're faculty there, you have a tremendous administrative and teaching burden. It's just hard to get research done. It's hard to get money. And I, I think we need to think of creative ways where these, you know, our temperate institutions can really step up financially to, to support these students. Um, I don't have too much time, but I'll just say, like, if we look at the NSF dimensions programs, joint funding programs, we have ways to you know, really share projects with places like South Africa, Brazil, uh, to undertake joint programs of like NSF NERC, NSF SNF. Uh, but we can do a lot of really good biodiversity work if we can support these scientists in meaningful financial ways. And I just want to say grasslands are important, and we focus a lot on trees and forests in terms of dealing with climate change, climate change mitigation. And I want to highlight a recent article from The Guardian when it's talking about carbon credits and buying carbon credits that a lot of these offset programs are just not working as intended. Um, the projects in Madagascar are actually working quite well. And if there's any forestry colleagues in the room, you might point out that you know, there are caveats to, to this specific study. But I think the important thing to keep in mind is that we, we need to be skeptical of selling credits to the worst producers and you know, treating biodiversity as a financial uh, commodity, essentially. And I think people are starting to put out really good literature and good ideas on what land management strategy should do, that we need to meet biodiversity goals, but prioritize the economic needs of what we're calling the rights holders, the people that are actually there, rather than prioritizing the economic needs of the worst violators. Um, and and why, why do we need this type of funding? Why is this work important? If you want reforestation to go well, you need to understand what are the native species, what are they, which ones are gonna do well and where do they go? And I, I think like this type of basic work needs to happen. If we look again at Ancafla Bay, very simple experiments, but they do take time to produce results trying to look at which species, which native species are given the best growth rates and that we need to focus on reforesting these edges of where there has been degradation rather than some countrywide programs that say, let's bring in non-native pine and eucalyptus and plant it in open grasslands. So we need to protect the biodiversity of the grasslands and then 
deal with the deforestation problem as well. And with that, I, I think I'm at time just to thank everybody uh, again. And then with that, we'll take a question or two. Thank you. So, um, I mean, I, I, I had the, the full team and, um, and uh, again, I got them up to find over the last uh, 40 years. And it's very noticeable. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the product of guys. Uh, I think I slipped into that. Okay, even I know that the grassland was there all the time. Uh, and I'm sure it was a number there long before there were humans there. But certainly, I've never been on my radar to question whether there are, there are endangered grassland communities or you know, whether there is really a biodiversity crisis in grassland. That is, that certainly, in, in, in forest. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, yes. Uh, so, so is there, are there concerns about grassland diversity as well? Yes, um, and, and thank you for asking that. And just to reemphasize, like the, the forests are important and there is problems that, that need to be addressed there. But certainly the grasslands, we see a lot of this, uh, at least the land uh, attached to river systems being converted to rice paddies, other plantations. And I, I talk about Ludicia simplex. It's super common. It's making most of the biomass, but it's not the only thing out there. There are diverse species you know, that are maybe in low abundance. And I think especially the sedges it, it, as well. Like in the last trip I went, um, a sedge specialist from Madagascar with me, was with me. She was just saying, yeah, I've never seen this before. And the same thing for, for bryophytes. The numbers are slipping me now, but it, I think something about 1,200 bryophytes, 28% endemic. And there are just a lot of things you don't know about these, these other types of organisms. And you know, how, how do we deal with it in a conservation sense? What's their ecological function? I, I understand that we can't address every problem or every question out there, but certainly there's undocumented biodiversity in the grasslands. And it's important for, I think, the insect and, and herpetological communities as well. Um, I, there was a really nice paper, I think, 2019 on gym snakes, where you're, you're finding really interesting, diverse snake communities in these highlands. Is it as species rich as the humid rainforest? No, but it, it's still interesting and it's just to circle back to that this is a fairly young ecosystem compared to the older forest of Madagascar so who knows where it will be in the future maybe time for one more if somebody's interested otherwise I think we're at time but when you're showing your investigation since there for the yeah you mentioned that some yeah. So, yeah, I, I didn't want to like necessarily have, have figures from this because we're submitting it, but now we're dealing with the genus as a whole and we are trying to incorporate uh, these types of effects. And, you know, I, I'm not a very skilled, like, landscape genomicist. I have a colleague that knows how to do this stuff a little better, but I still think it's a bit hand wavy. It's not like the most satisfying, like, statistical model, but we, we do try to say, well, what are the, the river effects here? So, so we're working on it. It didn't seem necessary to explain at least um, those simple cases, but if we just look at lemur distributions, certainly rivers seem to be a big barrier, especially in the Northwest. In your stir step diagram, if you went back beyond the, um, the right side of the graph, yeah. it stepped down again. Are we looking back at a particular direction or is there a job? So, I, 
I don't have a lot of confidence in those particular analyses for getting at the older times. I think there's been some interesting simulation work where they compared these stairway plots, which work on the allele frequencies, and then these other types of PSMC plots that are going to work on the sequence data directly from one or multiple individuals. It seems like the PSMC approach or that family of methods does better at getting at those older times, whereas the stairway plots get things on the scale of hundreds of generations. And what do so, those things mean? Um, it, it varies, but uh, insect, fruit. Um, not grassy. No, it, exactly. And not, not within mouse lemurs. I think once you start talking lemurs as a whole, it, it gets really fascinating, especially if you talk about like bamboo lemurs or other ones that have highly specialized diets. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think mouse lemurs are particularly valuable for these types of vegetative reconstructions. They're pretty generalists in, in that way. And I, I think it's really hard to make a mouse lemur go extinct, right? They're small body, there a lot of them, but we're we're doing a good job in some in some areas. Um, All right. Well, we are out of time. So everyone, please big hand for Dr. Bill.